Good afternoon. My name is Jackie Titus, and I'm delighted to be joined by my fellow City of Brampton colleague, Gurdeep Carr, as we get this opportunity to speak with Canada's first Black female cabinet minister, Zanena Akande, as part of the city's recognition of Emancipation Month. The City of Brampton is committed to celebrating Brampton's diversity and has been honoring this important month by various events and resources throughout the month of August, including the renaming of Dixie 407 Sports Park to Emancipation Park, which took place on August 12th. Thank you, Jackie. Before we dive in, I'd like to take a moment to recognize some of the many achievements of our guest today. Elected to the Ontario Legislature in 1990, and quickly appointed as a Minister of Community and Social Services, Zanena became the first Black woman to hold a cabinet position in Canada. Throughout her term in office, she was an advocate for employment, equity, youth, women, and people of color. Throughout, she has received numerous awards recognizing her commitment to education, equality, and social distancing, social di justice, sorry, <laughs> including being selected as a woman of distinction by the Young Women's Christian Association of Toronto. Zena, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. And as we near the end of Eman Emancipation Month, I'd want to ask, what does it mean to you? Well, it's a, it's a time to look back and to see, uh, to remember the names of all those people who contributed so much time to uh, having the slaves free and uh, the economic situations which made it necessary. Uh, it's a time to uh, evaluate how far we've come and to look again and see how far we still have to go because there's all kinds of emancipation. We may have, we may no longer be slaves, but we are very much affected by the economic situation in the country. And it influences so much of what we, we can achieve and do achieve. You've mentioned in previous interviews that the responses to your run for office varied and that there were people who resented your presence in government. Looking back at your experiences and your career, how were you able to contribute to the advancement of Black Canadians? Well, I think we've all, many of us have contributed in, in, in various ways. And one of the things, just being there in government for some people was a situation that they had not prepared themselves for. And uh, they were somewhat, some were somewhat resentful to find uh, a black woman in, in the Ontario government. There were already, uh, uh, Alvin Curling was there, so there was already a black man. But uh, it, it just meant one step further on what some people, hopefully few, felt was their territory. Thank you for the answer. I, I just want to ask another question. How did you deal with it? How was it when you first walked into it and you were there obviously with an open mind, this brand new win, this huge, huge amount of commitment work and an advocate for everyone, every visible minority you could say, and a woman, and especially at a time when it, it just wasn't heard of. How, how did you deal with this? One step at a time. Uh, at first of all, I knew that uh, women's advancement is is uh, welcomed by some, and not uh, and and looked on as a disadvantage, you know, to others. Mm -hmm. And so, a black woman's advancement had a double quality in that. And there are just as many happy people who are happy about your appointment as there are uh, people who are unhappy. Uh, so you you recognize that the the various steps that you've gone through in your own profession, and you just do the best job you can. You speak as clearly as you can. You try to avoid uh, getting into uh, um, any personal personal debates, but uh, I mean you are baited in the house. You know they do to try to get at you. And then, of course, even the reporters 
are, were not necessarily ready to accept uh, this change. Remember, it was 1990, and that's, that's 30 years ago, you know. Yes, yes. And so the, the attitudes were quite closed. Um, one of one of the things um, that I relate to is uh, Brampton right now. The city of Brampton is one of the youngest cities in Canada. And our average age group is between 33 to 36. And so in, in my mind, the youth are the future in this city. During your time as a parliamentary assistant, you were responsible for the design and implementation of the jobs of Ontario Youth Programme which provided youth from disadvantaged backgrounds, summer job opportunities. Are you able to share with us today some advice for Brampton's young leaders who are looking to make a difference in their community and even, even us as a whole at, at, at the city? What could we do? Even every citizen out there, every resident out there, some of us that have the opportunity of of mentoring youth or a lot of youth. Um, I'm approached by a lot of youth, especially young women. And what words of, of confidence and communication and, and almost mentorship can I say to, to let them know that, you know, if our prior generations can do it, there's nothing that can stop us now because we're not dealing with a lot of stuff that they've dealt with. Well, certainly encouraging them is, is there, telling them to, to, to try whatever it is they're interested in, to be determined, and not necessarily to feel that they must be welcomed, but to act as though they are. That's the thing. You put the smile on the face and you extend the hand. And, I mean, you know, there are very few people who want to be deliberately and obviously rude, and so you're accepted. But one of the things I would say is that Brampton should uh, meet with the businesses in Brampton and the various offices and get them to open their doors to these young people. That was what the Jobs Ontario Youth Program did. They, people who had uh, offices, businesses that had never before opened their doors to um, disadvantaged youth, to black youth, to youth from many, many different backgrounds, uh, opened their doors and um, these people were given an opportunity. I might tell you, even the civil service, the gentleman who was responsible for hiring summer help in the civil service told me that what he usually did was walk around to the various departments and, and, and ministries and offices and say, do any of you have a, um, a son or a daughter about 18 years old or a neighbor that you know of that could come and work? And this is how they got their summer staff, rather than going through the youth employment programs, so that there are youth out there who never know what it's like to work in an office, who have absolutely no idea what it's like to work in a government office, who never have those experiences, and so very often don't expect to move in that direction. I, I went to a school once, um, oh, a few years ago on, in Black History Month, and the principal came out and said to me, you're the reason I'm here. And I looked at her and I thought, and from her name, I think she's Italian. And I said, uh, you know, what do you mean? And she said, well, I was going to quit school at 16, the summer I was 16, and this, I couldn't get a job, and this Jobs Ontario Youth Program came, and they sent me to a school to assist with summer, assist the teacher with summer school, and from there they encouraged me, and I went through as a teacher. There are people who really found new experiences that they never thought existed, and that's what's important for the kids. It's, come on, let's see what this is like. Some of them have no idea. I. I have to say, I 100% I agree with you. If I could share my own personal story, even when I was growing up. Um, so certain visible minority groups, English is a second language. My parents, um, when they came from India, 
they may be really well educated or have great background, but English was a second language. And sometimes when people are in their late 20s or early 20s, it's really hard learning another language, raising children, starting a family, putting food on the table and affording a home and shoveling snow. So myself and my siblings, the three of us, we really found our own things. I have this habit of trying everything. My mother says, bullying your way through everything. <laughs> so I would. And, and I have to say, not every kid is designed that way to bully their way through life or, or not take that first no as a no. And I had that habit of not taking that first no. Not everyone does that because I've seen them, my friends, some of my relatives, cousins, a lot of people I've, I've been around. And I often think to myself, if I was like that, how, how would life be today? Would I have been who I am? Would I have had the opportunity of studying psychology, becoming a lawyer, running practices, all these different, taking part in a federal election? It, how did all of this happen? I, I think to myself, it's watching the struggles of that generation and then putting a mental attitude that you don't take the no, you find the way. You don't take the no, but there are so many young people, as you said, who are reluctant or hesitant about being rejected. Yes. They don't see themselves in those buildings, so they think, uh, well, I probably won't be able to get a job there. The other thing is that it's also interesting for the employers because they came later and they said, you know, these kids are smart. And I, I, I just looked at them and smiled. <laughs> I, you know, I wanted to say I know that. You know, <laughs> I've known that for quite some time. But they too were being introduced to a whole new group of kids that they had never experienced before, and they found were quite intelligent. Some of those kids got uh, jobs to work uh, every summer. And scholarships at the end. Wow. It, it wasn't. It wasn't part of the program. It was that their their employers were so impressed with their performance. Wow! So, thank you. That's that's amazing. And and I hope that continues. And I hope we can inspire the youth of of the cities that we're in now just to take the confidence and not have the fear and have even the employers. Yes. I, I like the idea of when you said that the businesses need to open their doors. Yeah. So we we at the city of Brampton need to put something together with guidance from you and and look at ideas of mm -hmm. what we can do today to serve the needs of today. And to introduce them to all the variety of things that are out there. And yes. even many, many more that, that than uh, there were in 1990. And the other thing is that there are more of us in some of those spaces so we can speak from inside those businesses, inside those offices and say, all right, it's time we widen the scope of who we invite in. And I'd also just add to that too, it, it's um, about the mindset of mm -hmm. our, our youth and the support that they're getting from home. Mm -hmm. and just from my own experiences, I'll speak quickly about my daughters, they're 26 and 28. They were very fortunate to have worked in an office building, worked for the government. They're very successful. And that started from the support that I gave them at home and put them on the right mindset that, no, you're not going to accept the right no. And also I made sure that they were prepared. So the employers, certainly, they have to do their part to give these youth some opportunities. But it really, it's about empowering our children to feel that confidence to go out there and not take that no for the first time and do what they need to do in life. But we also have to realize that there are families who themselves have not had that experience. That's true. Absolutely. This is very true. Who, who are so busy just trying to put food on the table and, and get the kids out to school that when you're talking about that, they don't know either. They don't even know. And so I always say to parents, and I'm going to say to you, you don't only encourage your own children, you can encourage everybody else. Yes, yes. I'm in agreement. Yes. I agree with that. That resonates. Thank you. Anything else from you, Gertie? I No, I'm, uh, I'm happy for you to take this opportunity to add to it. Okay. And Zanena, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Well, I, I, I do want to say one thing about uh, this uh, 
this occasion, the fact that we're celebrating our freedom and realizing that we're not all that free at times. Uh, I'm so impressed with the younger people. The fact that they know something that I did not know when I was young. I thought, as my parents thought, that once we broke the doors open and a few of us moved forward, mm -hmm. that uh, the, the world would settle in acceptance of us and would uh, uh, make sure that we had equal opportunity. These young people today know that that's not true. They know that the minute they stop being vocal, being verbal, being uh, observant about things, making sure that things are reported, making sure that oppression is demonstrated and the people know the minute they stop that, we may go right back the way it was many, many years ago. So I applaud the fact that, that younger people are observant of that, recognize the need to be vocal and to say that this is not good enough. And I'm so excited about that because you know, you always worry who's gonna take over the fight after the rest of us are, are gone. And I'm, I feel quite content that they'll be able to do it. And not only that, that they are supported by many others who are not of our race or of our group, or they're su still supported in that fight. And that's important, that's important. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Zanena, for having this candid conversation with us, listening to the experience and advice of others who have been trailblazers for the Black community. Um, and it's important that we continue to learn, grow, and improve our understanding of anti-Black racism. Gurdeep, any thank closing remarks? Yes, thank you, Zanena. Uh, just as Jackie has mentioned, I resonate the exact same feelings. But at this time, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank the organizer of this whole entire event, Gwyneth Chapman, Senior Advisor of the Black, African, and Caribbean Social, Cultural, and Economic Empowerment and Anti-Black Racism Unit. That's a mouthful, but I love saying it all because it covers everyone. <laughs> For connecting us with you as part of the leading, as part of leading the city's action plan on interdicting systemic racism anti-Black racism in Brampton and uplifting the social, cultural, economic position of Brampton's Black community. And I also like to say, I've had so many conversations with Gwen. Every occasion is a blessing because it's not just Brampton, but it's beyond that. And when I first met her, I said, you know, this is our playground for now. We're going to start with these pieces, but I hope this work continues and reaches ears and eyes that inspire and I, and I think it will. So I just really wanted to say thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.